Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Timing Research Show for April 25th, 2016. Today we will be talking about the 135th weekly report from Timing Research. Uh, my name is David Cosmeter. I'm, I'm the creator of Timing Research. And uh, I want to make a quick statement here about some changes I made. Um, for those of you watching, if, you, um, if you've been following Timing Research for a while, you Notice that there, um, or if you filled out the survey this week, you notice that there was a slight change in the order. So I'm going to share my screen here real fast. And uh, the multiple choice questions have been moved to question number one and two. Um, I did have the first open response question uh, before that previously. Um, so, um, so that. Hopefully it makes a little more sense for people now. And question three has been reworded to uh, to ask for more specific reasons about why everyone answered either higher or lower. I've also, um, and actually I want to thank uh, Doug Robertson, who hosted a few weeks ago, for asking me some questions uh, before that show that got me thinking about uh, this this that eventually led to reordering this and uh, making these changes. So uh, thanks to him for for uh, for getting me to think more about this. And uh, but I also recategorized or categorized the open response question uh, answers for question three, so everyone can see now the responses. Uh, you know, based on what the um, what each person selected. So they're still anonymous, of course, but but they're now categorized for um, how each respondent uh, thought about what's coming up in the markets. So anyway, I uh, if anyone has any feedback about um, the changes to the report, just go to timingresearch.com and click on the contact button, and you can send me a message there. Um, also, I wanted to tell everyone that I have the Q&A open this week, so if you are logged into your Google account, uh, you should have a green button on the right side of your screen that says Ask a Question. So if you want to ask a question at any point during the show, just um, just type out your question there, and uh, we will uh, get to it uh, at some point. So. Uh, I have Matt Buckley hosting for me again today, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. All right, David, thanks uh, again for having me. Uh, looking forward to uh, uh, the discussion with all the 500-pound uh, heads that you have assembled uh, today. Uh, Dean Jenkins from followmetrades.com, uh, Gary Dean from sentimenttiming.com, uh, Michael Filigera from LogicalSignals.com, and James Romelli uh, from AlphaShark.com. Good to see a couple of you guys uh, again. Let's just keep that order all day, Dean, Gary, Mike, and James. Why don't we just uh, take a quick uh, minute, minute or two, to give uh, everybody an executive summary of uh, who you are, what you do, and, uh, and, and where you are, more or less. So, Dean, we'll start with you. All right. Well, thanks. It's good to be back here. I always enjoy this. This forum, this is a great, a great show. So I'm Dean Jenkins, founder of FollowMeTrades.com. Um, we offer, you know, I'm a technical trader first, and we offer a stock picking service. You know, it's doing really, really good for several years, and this year too. I'm an educator. I have some classes on options and on uh, analyzing charts, and I run a live trading room uh, Monday through Thursday. Uh, so that's kind of the breadth of services. I'm located in Olympia, Washington, on the West Coast, and we're finally getting some nice weather here. <laughs> That's a quick, quick snapshot. We had 80s, three days in the 80s last week, man. Unheard wow. of. Wow. Was it still raining, though? <laughs> no, no. It's raining, it's raining now, of course. It's April in yeah. Washington. <laughs> but <laughs> that was Liquid. a nice, uh, nice, nice peek at what might be coming. That's funny. Liquid sunshine. Awesome. Well, uh, welcome aboard, Dean. Uh, Gary, how about yourself? Uh, I'm a... I'm Gary Dean, I'm a technical uh, analyst for Sentiment Timing. I actually started this with uh, Woody Dorsey, who's uh, he's a it's a sentiment guru, so it kind of fits in pretty well with this uh, this forum because I know that 
you guys work a lot off of uh, sentiment and how people feel what they're gonna what the market's gonna do in the upcoming week. And and Woody's been doing a, a really a sentiment poll for the last thirty five years. He's one of the founders of uh, tracking and uh, and charting how people are feeling about the markets, uh, both on a shorter term and a longer term view. And uh, what we basically do is we have these technical timing indicators that. Uh, project when these reversals are going to play out of on specific dates and then we match them up with uh, is sentiment in line with if we're looking for the markets to move lower uh, like we our date was uh, was April 22nd which was Friday and we had uh, bullish extremes on uh, both the short term and the, the longer term uh, sentiment so from there what we do is then use a technical analysis to again confirm the direction that we believe the market's going to be going and then from there uh, particular prices as far as where the spiders or the S&P may make those reversals and uh, and it's a we do our newsletter uh, twice a week and we put out alerts uh, during the week when we see either a high sentiment uh, reading or a low sentiment reading and just to keep everybody uh, intact on what's going on Awesome, Gary. Uh, welcome aboard. Nice to thank you. Nice to be working with you. Uh, and Mike. And good afternoon. I'm Michael Pilar. I am located in San Francisco, and um, right now I operate a website, LogicalSignals.com, and through that website, I have a trade room, and um, where we meet every day, and uh, from about eight o'clock. Uh, Eastern till most of us will trade through most of the day. Uh, the room will stay open as long as people are willing to trade. Otherwise, uh, I just kind of close it as as need be. Um, currently, I am working on releasing uh, two algorithms, which are basically uh, not basically they are auto traders, and so it'll be uh, for use within my trade room. Awesome, Mike. Welcome aboard. And uh, finally, James. Hi, my name is <clears throat> James Romelli. I uh, work for Alpha Shark Trading, based here in Chicago. And we have a whole uh, kind of wide variety of products and services that we provide our customers. But our main focus is unusual options activity and equity options order flow. So what I spend all of my day doing isn't really sitting and looking at charts or flagging technical levels, looking for breakout points. But what I'm watching is equity options order flow and watching the tape, looking for big blocks of equity options being bought or sold by institutions, and then using that to glean information off on what it is you know these institutions and hedge funds are betting on in the stock market. So I can get a lot of information about what institutions are thinking about commodities, indices, rates, different currency pairs, all by looking at where they're putting their risk capital in the equity options market. We also focus a little bit on um, some catalyst types of trade setups around earnings and some other uh, technical setups, but unusual options activity is our main focus. Awesome, and, and James, we talked about this, uh, I think the last time you were on, it's, you know, it's super important to you, to, to have unusual objects activity in, in part of your scan uh, because that does mean something. You know, in the old days, like you and I talked about, guy walks into a pit and says, hey, give me 80,000 Goldman Sachs, you know, May, whatever's. Everybody looks around and goes, okay, well, that's a lot of money. That guy's not an idiot. That guy might know something. He might be a complete idiot or drunk today, but he's at least – so following order flow is uh, – it's like being one of those, what's that thing called, the remora? Or the thing that uh, swims along with a shark and just kind of, <laughs> hence the term, right? Uh, I think that's great. So we'll, I'm going to be picking your brain today to see if you have any uh, anything on your radar right now as far as unusual options activity. Um, and, folks, my name is uh, Matthew Buckley. My, uh, you guys can call me Wiz. I, I flew the Hornet for about 15 years for the Navy. Uh, taught myself how to trade options in the early 90s before there was even before Al Gore invented the Internet. And uh, I kind of applied everything I was learning flying fighter aircraft to trading because trading technically is a form of combat. Somebody's going to win. Somebody's going to lose. And why wouldn't you use the same methodologies, being disciplined, uh, contingency planning, implementing tactics, uh, managing risk, all those things uh, – I, 
I, I combined and did really well trading on my own, and I popped up on the radar of one of the uh, largest of all ARB firms in the country, uh, Peak Six Investments, and then uh, went there for about three, four years. Was also the founder and CEO of the Options News Network, ONN.TV, uh, and then decided Chicago winners suck. And after about three years, if you stay more than three years in Chicago, you're done. You're there forever. So around that point, I just said, okay. So now I'm down here in beautiful, sunny Fort Lauderdale, where I started Top Gun Options about six years ago. So that's that's a little bit about me. So let's go right to the uh, to the report, um, and we'll go uh, top to bottom. Question one uh, to you, Dean. Based on any technical, fundamental, seat of the pants, any of your whatever you have in your cockpit, any indicators you want to use, uh, would you predict that the S&P 500 is going to move higher or lower from today's open to uh, Friday's close? Yeah, so I'm I'm strictly a technical trader. You know, I think fundamental information matters, but it's all been um, acted on in the market and the price patterns are really telling us, you know, that's the reality. Price and volume are the only undisputable realities in the market. And uh, uh, to, so the short answer to the question is it's going down, baby. It's going down, and um, I have a high conf. I got like an eighty percent confidence on that. Wow! When we get a chance when we get a chance when you know we're we're given the rationale. I'll show some charts and I'll show why. But yeah, it's going down, and there's a high probability of that from uh, my analysis. Wow, eighty percent and down, baby, down. We threw a baby in there. <laughs> All right, uh, Gary, what do you think? Uh, I'm actually on the same boat. I do believe that. We are going to be heading lower this week, and uh, a pretty high confidence level on that. I, I'll go 79 <laughs> percent. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm around the same. I'm, I'm 80 percent. There's uh, sentiment is at extremes, uh, and the it, with the Fed talking on Wednesday, I know a lot of people are banking on that's going to be holding the markets up. But everything is kind of baked into what they've said, and it's out there. So I think really. The only surprise that could come, if there is a surprise, is going to be to the downside, and we have, uh, you know, our sentiment charts, and as well as technical uh, indicators are uh, are also looking lower as well. So I'm pretty confident that we'll end a week lower than where we are right now. Wow! All right. Two for down with a pretty high probability. The 79% was good. It was like being on uh, the Price is Right and betting <laughs> Go $1. one dollar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, all right, Mike, what do you think? Uh, I am actually going to go with higher. And I believe that I don't disagree with uh, what's already been said, uh, but I think that the Fed will not have any effect, and therefore the primary fear of missing the rally will take over again and uh, they'll be jumping back in and for no other reason than a new high and I, I don't think the fundamentals or even the technicals are supportive um, but I, I think that it moves beyond all of that because of the number of algorithms that are in force and working every single second of every day Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say higher, and I'm giving that about 65%. Wow. All right, we have our first dissenter. James, it's up to you, man. <laughs> I'm going to have to say that I am expecting the market to sell off this week. Um, a couple of reasons for that, you know, the main reason is that even though we did make you know a new recent high in last week's trading, if you take a look at the daily chart there, the S and P futures, we have these wicks on the top of all of the candles. So even as we made new highs, the market couldn't manage to hold them. We're down a little bit today. We're off of the lows today, but I see us kind of consolidating around here and eventually heading lower. <clears throat> Earnings have not been. Um, uh, all that stellar, we're really kind of in the very beginning of the cycle. But one of the things that is kind of shaping my at least short-term view is that on Friday, uh, we saw a humongous amount of puts being bought in a couple of different names and some ETFs. And, you know, whenever we see options being bought on Friday, particularly ahead of, uh, you know, a week when there isn't really any other catalysts, I can look at that and say, wow, well, a trader has a pretty strong line here. They're buying these options on Friday. They're willing to take the time decay over the weekend and we saw a whole lot of bearish activity in mining plays and basic materials plays out through May or June so that's short term 
bearish activity from institutions and was definitely some of the most interesting and largest activity we've seen over the past uh, month or so. So I'm, I'm expecting the market to sell off this week, and I'm fairly confident in that. I only have one long position in my entire book right now. Um, the rest is short, so I'd say I'm probably about 70% confident in that. Okay, uh, the best. So we got another lower with uh, with a seventy or eighty. That's awesome. The best part about being the host is I go last, so you're all wrong except for Mike. Uh, market goes higher. That's why I love hosting. Um, in my opinion, uh, and here's here's what's interesting is I agree with everything everybody said about lower, um, but it's just it, it's one of those things where I just I shake my head and you can't you can't fight the Fed. Um, let me. Get on here. So hopefully you can see this chart of the S P 500. At, ever since that that February ish bottom, every time we've had an up, we give a little bat up, a little back up, a little back up, a little back. I think we're doing the same thing right here, up, and we're giving a little bit back. If we hold half of this move, like 2075, maybe 2080, I think it's incredibly it, it's bullish. For stupid and awful reasons, this is—I I tell my subscribers here at TGO, this is a hold your nose rally. It's just you can't—you can't fight the Fed and low interest rates. She's not going to say anything Wednesday other than "I love you." I mean, there's there's no way in hell she's going to. Uh, the the worst she can do is telegraph that they might take a hard look in in June, and that might freak the the market out. But in my opinion, she's not raising rates. Uh, she she's definitely not in June. She's not doing it in the fall because we got an election, and she doesn't want to be seen as political. And then I think it's December. I think she puts one on the scoreboard just before the buzzer at the end of the year. That that's when that's going to happen. So I think in the in the lack of just uh, I forget who said it. I mean, her earnings have sucked. It's they've been doing the 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 Wall Street earnings dance here, right? If you can't hit the ball over the net, you lower the net. This was the. Uh, uh, this quarter had the most pre-warnings out of companies in in like history when I was uh, doing my research. Uh, everybody runs out to the microphone and says, oh, we're going to be awful, awful. And then when we report bad, the market goes, hey, that wasn't as awful, awful as we – and the stock goes up. So in the absence of really bad earnings uh, or Janet coming out and saying, yeah, we might raise in June, I think we just drift higher. And I'm going to – you ready for this one? I'm going to go with 100% because I have a weekly bull put spread on <laughs> the 2075, 2080. So I'm a little, uh, I'm a little biased there. So that's, that's one of the reasons uh, I think you're right there, Mike. Um, okay, uh, let's move on though. You guys kind of answered question two as part of uh, your question one, which was, you know, how uh, how strong is your conviction? So for question three, and I know we, we did a little of this in all of our answers, let's get a little bit more specific or, or talk us through a little bit more uh, of what you're thinking. So for all the high guys, Give us give us a little bit more detail uh, about high and for the lower guys same thing. So Dean, you kick us off with your down baby down. <laughs> okay. So can you, can you see my screen, my chart now? I hope. You bet. Yeah. Okay. So this is the uh, E mini, the S&P 500 futures contract on a 120 minute chart. And usually I for like predicting the week I look at a 60 minute chart. But to, to in order to see this whole seven week rally, I had to go to 120 minute chart to to see it. So we've been in this this rally here which has been amazing for you know about seven weeks and if we drill in you know so I'm a I'm an Elliott Wave guy and I use Dow Theory right and before anybody rolls their eyes at, at Elliotticians and their geeky stuff um, you know I use a real simple you know there I only care I don't memorize 20 patterns it's just hey is there a big impulsive move is there a corrective wave and then there's a the next impulsive move right it's pretty simple pretty repeatable but I use Dow Theory to say when's it going to trend change so we had a you know, six, seven week rally up, and now Dow Theory tells us that a trend is changing when we start putting in new lower lows, lower highs, lower lows, and we're doing that on this on this 120 minute chart. And in the context of you know a seven week rally, it's showing me you know we got uh, a bearish divergence, we're losing momentum, right? So I just see a real clear case being made here that we're gonna you know have a corrective wave to this big last move up, you know. So also if we look at the you know, you mentioned the S&P 500. Here's the here's the uh, daily chart on that. That's a good one, All right? So let me see. Here's the S&P 500 daily chart, All right? So we do have a sequence here. You know, this Dow theory, right? Lower lows, lower highs, lower lows, and so far a lower high. And you know that high is holding at about 21.16. 
and we reversed right before that. And so if we take that out, we're probably going to put in new highs, take out last May's high, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I think we came pretty close to that, but we're, we're ready. I think really, really good probability. We've got to see it play out that we'll go take out that last low, and, uh, and this bear market will march on, and I think it's starting now. Um, so you, you think we're kind of in this bull market trap or, or a bear, a bull market in a, in a bear market is what we've yeah. kind of seen since February. Bear market rally. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. And I think, I think you know, uh, I'm going to have a special live trading room open right around the uh, announcement on Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, mm -hmm. We're just going to watch that. And, you know, there's always volatility, even if they come out with their, you know, with their mouth zipped, right? And, you know, sure. they'll be looking and go, hey, Janet, she put her hair clip in a different place this time. That means something, right? It's just, it's just volatility. And we got some great setups to trade, you know, news drops and volatility. So we'll just have some fun with that. But I think the bigger trend here is we're, we're heading down for sure. Uh, not for sure. I, I said 80%, right? But it's pretty clear to me. <laughs> exactly. Well, nothing that's good. Sure, right? Yeah, nothing's, nothing's sure. I mean, it's, but to your point, even if you don't believe we're going down, it, I, I think everything you just said begs to make sure you have some portfolio protection on. You got, you got, you got to fly around this market with an injection seat because once somebody yells fire, if it might be you're going to get trampled on if, if you're not if you're not expecting it. Um, awesome, Gary. Got, this is the first time I've been in here where we actually had real real dissension. So this is this is actually kind of fun. <laughs> that is good, and that's that's interesting. Yeah. Well, and and we'll we'll get into more of that here in a little bit. But uh, Gary, what do you think? Uh, uh, well, let me. <clears throat> I'm going to try to show my screen here. Make see if it works. Uh, um, okay, so share. Let me just make sure that we got the right screen up. Um, okay, so really my reason for the lower... Can you see the screen okay? You bet. Yes, okay, we can. perfect. So really our, you know, the way that we're viewing this, first of all, we were... We were expecting we for the really since uh, uh, it was the middle of March was our actual turn date for the markets to move lower was uh, was April 22nd which was uh, Friday so we saw some strength going into it but this is really the kicker is when you d these this is our sentiment chart so up here it's showing that 95 percent of the people were uh, were bullish 90 93 so we have all these extreme bullish readings on uh, on where the market's going to be going on the short term and then when we take a look at the longer term you can see that we're up at levels that each time we've been here this is just a moving average and it, it's our longer term view but every time we've been at these levels this is where everybody's getting bullish on the markets and this is where everyone gets bearish on the markets and uh, it, it's one of the things. It's it's lining up where we have our extreme bullish readings near the top here. We have our turn date, and then if we just take a look at our regular, th this is the VIX and the S and P, and we we have our bullish divergences on the VIX as it's finding support, as the S and P is in resistance, and and it it seems like every time we're up at these levels and we have. Our, our sentiment readings at these extreme levels, everybody's on the side that this time is going to be different. And it might. Uh, th this market's been crazy. I, I do believe on a, let's just say on a, on a short-term basis, like for this week, I do believe it's going to be heading down. Uh, it does, it, is it going to be a bear market? It, it would make perfect sense if it did. I, it, it is something that we've been saying has a high probability of, of it turning into, and it, it could be a bear market within a bull market where it, it's uh, going to the Elliott Wave count part. Uh, you know, if we, if we just do a 50% a, a uh, retracement from this move right here, it's bringing the S&P down to the 1960 or even all the way down to the 1874, but if you take a look at the at the bigger picture of it and and that's the going back from the uh, 2009 lows um, there there's a chance that we could you know we could be entering into a much much larger uh, it, just retracement of of the s p that could bring it all the way down into the you know the 15 1400s and even though from where we came from it's you know it, it doesn't really seem like that much of a drop but this market's never seen a drop that that far that's why it could turn into uh 
you know, where people are looking at it as, uh, you know, the end of the world. And I, 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 I'm with you where the, you know, the central banks are going to do whatever they can to try to keep things maintaining them. But at some point, they're gonna, I, I'm, I'm on the side that they're going to, you know, hit a speed bump and the, you know, just the talking the markets up is, isn't going to work anymore. And it may have a lot to do with just the company earnings and stuff like that. But short term, I am... Uh, you know, I'm I'm pretty confident on on the uh, on the direction part, and it's primarily because I've seen this happen at the last top that we made in February, and where we had a series of extreme bullish readings, but yet we never made a new high, and and so it's you have this sentiment that's uh, kind of running in front of where price is, and typically when that happens. Uh, most of them find themselves on the wrong side, so that that's really those are our reasons on why I do believe that we're we're going to be seeing some type of important top if we haven't already seen it. Interesting, and, and you know, you know, it's I like what you said, Gary. With the, I think the big, you know, to use a Fred Sanford, you know, the big one, Elizabeth. I, I think the big one, that's when it's going to happen, is when we lose faith in central banks when when what they're doing where we all kind of wake up that's when terror is going to strike and the market like goes to zero uh, when it's we lose so fast too that you know, it's it, it it's crazy because there's so many people that you know they're they're watching every single tick of their portfolio on their phone and the minute everybody starts saying we're breaking out they're buying and it's usually at the top and when everyone says that we're crashing they're <laughs> selling and you know before you know it you have the the smart money that's taken the other side of the trade and, and it's just this seesaw that's been going back and forth but the market's just moving so so fast that nobody really has a chance to think and it's their emotions that are making these trades and when you get into emotional trades it's you're gonna be wrong ninety percent of the time at least that's what I found out mm -hmm. yep and another another plug for just having some sort of portfolio protection on uh, right because you're right the speed with which you know markets can go down it's the, the, the big institutional guys in the back of the theater, they're the ones that are going to yell fire, and you're going to get trampled. So right. I, right. I agree. I agree, Gary. Uh, Mike, what do you think? Um, I'm also an Elliott Wave analyst and have been for over 35 years. And when I take a look at the daily chart, I think that uh, we are putting in a final fifth wave up off of that 1810 low that we saw in February. Off of that, I've yet to count five up. Um, so I still think that out of this move, we will yet see a new high above 2131, 2134. Uh, I can't tell you how much, uh, because again, Elliott Wave does not take any fundamentals into consideration. Uh, but I've been writing for several years now that my belief is that the markets will go and move to new highs on negative input. And I continue to stand by that. And I think that what's been a great contributor to that is the fact that we have so many different algorithmic traders in the market, which basically an algorithm does not have emotion, so it doesn't care what overbought is, what oversold, uh, where positions are because it's moving so quickly as others have mentioned the markets can move so quickly so they're locking in profit they're locking in a trade usually before you even recognize that a trades taking place they're already locking in both sides or three sides and it goes over into the done pile and, and goes to expiration uh, often or you have an early expiration and they just you know, exercise their calls or puts and they already have the other side. Having said that, I think that um, we do have a lot of people that hang on every tick. We have a lot of day traders that hang on every tick. And they contribute to a lot of the intraday moves. Now, whether or not this market this particular week might end lower than where we started, um, does not diminish, in my view, the fact that we will move higher, nor does it diminish, in my view, the fact that I do believe 
that the ultimate decline is coming because I believe that what we're what we're quickly approaching here is the penultimate top for equities. And so and that's been in the making for well over a hundred years. I mean we could we could go out and we could do a techn technical analysis and Elliott wave analysis on the stock prices for the last two hundred years. And under that type of that grand scale uh, or that large of a scale, we are we are quickly reaching that top. When that one's reached, I want to just throw my two cents in. It's like when that decline starts, it's going to take probably ten years before the masses realize that we're going down. <laughs> and and I know we kind of chuckle, but think about it. Usually, when the masses of traders realize, oh my God, we're going down or going up. It's what I call the point of recognition. And that usually happens for those who study L8 wave within the third wave, which in equities is normally the largest and the strongest within a five wave sequence. So if it's, if it's going to happen there, then a, quite a bit of the decline or the rally has already occurred. So I go back to that, you know, higher this week based on my shorter term L8 wave. Count. And then also, I just think that it's like people are still in that mood or in that thought process of every pullback is a buying opportunity. Yeah, that's that's a great point, uh, Mike. I <laughs> I tell my subscribers all the time: you you trade the market you have, not the market uh, that you want. And I think we're all, even though you and I are higher, uh, I I think. We all think it should be lower based on. I agree. I agree totally. Yeah, that that's what's nuts is you just can't fight the Fed. I I think every trader or investor who's tried to pick a top in this market has been knocked off uh, each time. You know, nobody rings a bell at the bottom and nobody you know sounds an air horn at the top. And anybody who's been picking the top of this market has usually uh, been wrong. So that's why I call it a hold your nose rally. I I, I don't want to be trading it up, but Hell, if that's that what they're going to do, then that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> uh, and to be, honest, to be honest with you, and to be fair to the conversation, that it's one of the reasons that longer-term positions. Yes, I I position where I'm more of a volatility trader. So mm -hmm. I am going to be, be keying off of the VIX. I am going to be keying off of what I where I see premium, and I am going to be looking to put on you know spreads that are going to be more efficient in. Making money when the market collapses, mm -hmm. because uh, I think you won't have the time to put them on once it begins. So I don't disagree with what right. others are saying. In particular, that once this thing gets going, it's going to be like get out of the pool. <laughs> That's exactly right, and and it's like I said, it's funny because I think we're all in agreement about fundamentals and underlying strategic stuff. It's just what the market does with it and direction. Um, James, what are you seeing in the option space, and what are you thinking about? Have it, so, uh, are you seeing a lot of put buying? Call, you know, what what are you seeing as far as short term? Yeah, I mean, the short term bias is definitely to the downside here. Uh, for one, I would love to see the all out chaos in the market that Michael just described, because I mean, those of you who are options traders know that you know when the market is absolutely collapsing like that and everyone is panicking and rushing for the exit it's so much easier to make money trading options and so much easier to trade the volatility and you know it's kind of tough with the market that we have now but i still don't think that you know i'm ready to to just you know buy into this you know we're going to grind higher for an indefinite period of time until we finally hit the tipping point and especially because you know of the price action on the very short term that we're seeing here, like I described earlier. But we have a lot of stocks reporting earnings this week, and options order flow tends to get a little muddy around earnings because if the market is working the way it should and traders are not trading with information they're not supposed to have, meaning the actual corporate earnings that are going to be released, no one knows what they're going to be. So you see a, an increase in options trading um, to begin with. You would normally expect to see that on both sides. You would expect to see speculators coming in, buying calls if they think the stock's going to move higher, or buying calls to protect short stock positions, and hedgers coming in and buying puts. I haven't seen a single stock that's reporting earnings this week with unusual call activity um, in the last week or so far today. And I mean, we have a pretty broad cross-section of 
sectors yeah. reporting this week. I mean, I've seen enormous blocks of short-term put buying in U.S. Steel, BP, UTX, Expedia. Um, last week, Starbucks sold off for the first time on earnings in like three years. You know, it's it's in my opinion, it looks like institutional money has almost no expectation for any of these stocks to rally on earnings, and for that reason, I, I you know I have to remain bearish for now in the short term. You know, one of the things that you know makes me much more confident in my <coughs> statement is that all through March and the end of February, we were, I mean, it was a very boring time for us because we were tracking maybe 10% of the normal unusual block equity options trades that we've seen, and we've started to see that volume come back now with the start of earnings, and, you know, all they can do is get short. Mm -hmm. That's interesting that uh, it just hearing that the options activity really isn't that bullish this week, it's, uh, that's why this is, it, it's, that's why I hate this. It's bizarro market I, because I think everybody, like I talked about with the Wall Street game, came out pre-warned or has telegraphed that things are just going to be miserable, and then they're not as miserable, and then this, you know the stock bids higher. So it's interesting to see that the options market isn't at least, I, I hate using this term, gambling, but at least speculating that earnings are going to be good because everybody thinks it's going to be miserable, and then when it's not as miserable as everybody thought, it, it turns turns out to be bullish. It's just... Yeah. And and that's kind of that that makes it really tricky to kind of get a read on where institutions yeah. sentiment is at any given time. I mean, it's to the point now where you know I trade earnings pretty actively, and I, I use kind of a number of uh, technical and <clears throat> fundamental analysis to arrive at a trade idea ahead of earnings. But now it's to the point where I don't even bother reading the report or listening to the call. It doesn't really matter what they say. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's interesting to see that you know a lot of the names that. You know, I would normally want to be, you know, looking to get long this week because of those other reasons: historical performance on earnings, uh, you know, money flow in the actual underlying stock. The options market is is completely disagreeing with all those setups this week. So, hmm. I, I I just don't I just don't see um uh, I I don't see a good earnings week. And because we have such a broad kind of cross section of the economy, that's you know we're going to get a little look into this week. We're talking about materials, energy. Um, uh, tech, consumer, consumer staples, tech, consumer discretionary, pretty much anything that you know mm -hmm. you would want if you were asking about the health of the economy. I think it's going to be tough to rally. Interesting. Yeah. I, uh, uh, so obviously, get, going last, I agree with everything everybody said. So I'm not going to beat any dead horses. So I, uh, the main thing I'm looking at, it's it's all about the Fed, and I hate saying that because I don't believe it. But it is, <laughs> so that's all the market cares about right now. Uh, because it, even horrific earnings uh, really can't drag this uh, market down. Uh, what else? Oil. Well, we saw oil whip us around in January and February. What about now? Eh, the the Doha, all the uh, the the quote 500 pound heads like on Comedy Central, uh, CNBC. I call it Comedy Central. They said if Do if there's no deal in Doha, oil's going to zero. The market's you know. Cats and dogs living together, mass hysteria. It didn't happen. Uh, a little bit of sell-off in oil, and then everything rallied the next day. It was it was a uh, buy on the news. Um, so I agree with everything everybody said. It's just it's tough to put this market down without a really 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 good reason. And and I get the technical stuff and Fibonacci's and the square root of pi and all that type of stuff. But I just after you know from from Bernanke to to Yellen, it's just it's all about the central banks. I mean, even over in Europe, Mario Draghi, when was it, 2012? His exact quote was, I will do whatever it takes to save the euro. So when you got central banks, essentially it's like the Pope coming out and telling Catholics there is no hell. I mean, we're just going to run around and do whatever the hell we want uh, until someday, oh, wait, actually there is a hell, and then it's going to be mass hysteria like we talked about. Um, Okay, uh, let's go to question four then, uh, uh, back to Dean. Uh, Microsoft and Google, they reached an agreement a week ago-ish to drop the complaints against each other. They've been battling it out, um, and they dropped all patent loose, uh, lawsuits against each other. That was last year. What, what are your thoughts on how this will impact the two companies uh, and the rest of the tech industry writ large? All right, so uh, I don't care. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm with. I was I was smiling when James was talking. Where he said, you know, he doesn't even you know read earnings reports or or go into the co the uh, you know the conference calls anymore. And I don't either. In fact, 
you know, I'm, I'm a technical trader. I think all that information matters. You know, what's going on with Google and Microsoft? It matters absolutely. Um, you know, but do I want to sit here and watch? You know, the weatherman tell me what's going on outside, or I just want to go out? You know, or what it should do? Or just go look out at the sky, man. And go, oh, look, it's raining. <laughs> um, and so, you know, what investors and traders think about the information that's coming out is reflected on the reality of the charts, and I respond to that. I think it'll be good for consumers, right? That you know, the you know, this cat fights between companies like Google and Microsoft, um, and I think it just distracts them. And you know, we would just want their their cool products to work and good support and good service, and and yeah. give us some tradable patterns on your stock, would you please? Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I don't, I haven't studied the issue. I don't care. I think it's good for the companies. I think it's good for consumers. You know, get focused on on products and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's my take on it. You know, interesting, you know, way more interesting discussion about oil earlier. I, uh, uh, if I could just digress back to that for just a minute. Sure. Exciting. So uh, I should be sharing the oil daily chart here. Um, I, I got a blank screen this time. Uh, blank Dean. screen this time. Okay, let's yeah. let's push the buttons here and see what happens. Screen share. Don't cut the blue wire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do you try that one? Looks like it's got some price action on it. Is that it? Yep. Okay, here's the oil uh, futures daily contract. And, uh, you know, it definitely did find a bottom. And I said I used Dow Theory, right? We're, I'm looking for a trend change where it takes out previous, you know, higher low, you know, downtrend, lower lows, lower highs. When it takes out those and starts putting in higher highs, higher lows, and it's absolutely doing that. And if we look, if we pop up to weekly real quick here, you know, the thing dropped from uh, 140 bucks a barrel to, uh, you know, down to about 30. And this is clearly a Elliott Wave 3. Nobody, I don't think, could argue that on this time frame. You know, biggest, most uh, impulsive move on the chart. Clear evidence that Wave 4 is starting. That takes us up to 63 to $84 a barrel on a technical chart. And I think that has started. There's clear evidence of it. Not good news at the pump for us, but if we get this trade right, right, you can go buy a new car and not worry about it. So, uh I think oil is, is showing signs that it's heading back up here. It'll take time through this year and the next, right? This is a weekly chart. But the technicals are that are really, really good. And natural gas is lagging it and showing it's back here where it looks like it's getting ready to recover as well. So we're we're getting ready to have some orders staged on natural gas and participate. So that's what I think of the Google Microsoft lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> that was a nice segue. You did that you did that very well. That was good. Um <laughs> Gary, do you have any thoughts on the uh, uh, Alphabet kind of versus the, Microsoft? Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat. I'm uh, I'm more on a on a technical basis, and we really just look at the uh, the overall market as a general. So I don't really follow that much as far as uh, you know companies and and stuff like that. So I don't have too much input on it uh, as far as you know what the question actually is, but. I mean, looking at the charts wise, it's uh, it, I mean, Microsoft is taking a pretty good hit, but it's at support right now, and and it, it could bounce. But how that works out as far as with the uh, you know, the overall question, I'm, I like I said, I'm I'm more just on the technical end of things as well as uh, you know, the overall market and and sentiment and stuff like that. So I don't have really too much to add to this. I'm sorry about that. How about uh, you, Mike? Sorry, I think I was talking to myself. Oh, it was a great conversation. I thought I, I, thought I gave the wrong answer. I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. No, no offense. Um, yeah, that, you really got me mad at that part. Uh, sorry about that, uh, Mike. How about you? I normally would not have any opinion, but I've got two friends that are patent attorneys, and um, one of them is working on the has been working on the Apple Samsung ongoing case which I believe is now in its second decade and um, my other friend was actually working on the Google Microsoft uh, cases and the biggest comment that I got out of both of them was we're out of jobs so I think that the overall effect for each individual company is that maybe they'll have more money to put in research and development 
Mm. Uh, Google's got some wonderful plans for new products, and uh, one of them being the uh, driverless car, and some other things, which is their primary reason for switching their name over to Alphabet, because it was more inclusive of all the different divisions. Um, Microsoft, I think, just kind of got tired of the battle, and just thought, you know, hey, look, let's let's just stop. Let, let's stop all this crap and, and move on, and uh, stop wasting corporate money on uh, frivolous lawsuits, which just clog up the courts and burn up more time, very similar to an Elliott Fourth Wave, burn up more time than it does actually price. Um, <laughs> and so I think consequently what happens out of all of that is for each of the stock, nothing. I think for future development, great strides. I think for the rest of Silicon Valley, and I say that because of my proximity to Silicon Valley, I think a lot of lawyers will be out of a job. <laughs> no. And I think that would, that would be a great start, wouldn't it? <clears throat> would be. <laughs> You're exactly right in, in a lot of the points you made, especially with the you know, the only ones who get rich are the attorneys. I mean, uh, the companies spend an inordinate amount of money on this type of stuff, and you're right. They could be innovating. They could be hiring. They could be acquiring. They could be doing a hell of a lot of stuff than litigating, uh, right. and I agree with you, Mike. I, I think Microsoft didn't necessarily... Uh, I think they did give up because Google's Goliath. I don't even. I haven't traded Microsoft in about 20 years. What is it like 30 bucks still? I don't think it has even moved a nickel. Um, Google will take is taking over the world. They have more information than the NSA. Um, the NSA actually tries to get info out of Google because they have so much uh, data. And you're right, they're going to be in cars and planes. And uh, I, I even heard a rumor that they're going to try and launch their own rockets, a la Elon Musk. So I think Microsoft just kind of looked at uh, at it as a David versus Goliath type of thing and, and surrendered. Um, that's my take on it. And as far as the two stocks. You, you, you got to own Google. It, it's just, like I said, it acquires the world. The four horsemen of the tech apocalypse, uh, you know, Amazon, Facebook, Google, um, well, and actually three. Uh, I was going to say Twitter. Never mind. That was embarrassing. Uh, James, what do you think about the uh, Microsoft Google uh, settlement? So, yeah, definitely something that's positive for both companies. I think it's really interesting that, um, uh, you know, <clears throat> they got to the point now where they're able to come to an agreement and, you know, realize that, lawsuits and you know general litigious nature is not good for innovation and I think it's really important for firms like Google and Microsoft Apple to realize that now that everything is connected to the internet pretty soon our cars will be too and driving themselves you know the lines between the ecosystems that these firms operate in kind of blur a little bit and I think consumers are going to be operating in more than one going forward and you know you start to see this you know Microsoft now for the first time in <clears throat> ever is now allowing uh, Apple to offer their products on um, in iOS there's iOS versions of productivity tools that everyone loves from Microsoft so I think it's you know they got the right idea it's important to work together or at least not be outright litigious with each other at each other's throats if I had to pick one to own I actually said I only have one long position right now it actually is Microsoft um, I was long Google uh, into earnings, but got uh, squeezed out of that one. <laughs> Both of these companies, in the short term, though, I I wouldn't really be looking to get long either. Um, they both got absolutely crushed on earnings, a huge gap lower. Uh, Microsoft recovered really well from the lows. Google did as well. But statistically speaking, after a big gap lower like that on earnings, they're going to drift lower or at least stagnate until next earnings. So I think I'd probably want to wait a little bit before jumping into uh, into either. There could be some more downside here. They haven't really gotten close to their, you know, their recent lows yet. Hey, um, Matt, are you still there? You may have to key your mic again there, Matt. <laughs> yeah, it looks like you're muted again. Can you hear me? 
Yeah. There you go. My God, man. I'm, my latent computer here is about to get flight tested out the uh, the window. Um, we have about uh, 10 minutes to go, guys. So uh, what I like to do at the end here is I always like to try and uh, squeeze a trade out of you, uh, whether one you got on right now that you really like, obviously, uh, or something that you're looking at, whether it's short-term, long-term, whatever it is, uh, why don't you uh, give us give us something uh, that you like. Uh, Dean, we'll start with you. All right, I'm getting there. That was you, I was, you were faster than I expected. Um, all right, hopefully I'm sharing, or do I have to reshare again, man? Can you see that? Yep. Yeah, I can see a chart. Okay, now I'll go back to it. So this is Intel. Um, I, I, it's it's early, but I like the I like the short play on Intel right now. I worked for Intel for 14 years, and uh. Uh, some of my friends who still work there subscribed to my stock pick service, and and they gave me the the stink eye when I told them I was going to short Intel because that's not good news for them. They have options, and you know their whole thing's wrapped up in that. But um, it is what it is, and I like it. Um, in this, you know, pretty pretty volatile before we got a really clear impulsive move down, a kind of a perfect way for back up and clear evidence that we're heading down again. You know, it jumped on earnings a little bit, but now it's it's drifting down. And it has been kind of married to the S&P 500, and I think, you know, not in this period, but the earlier, you know, five or six weeks. And, you know, they just announced. So that is one earnings report I did read because, you know, I'm interested in the company and whatnot. And uh, their earnings report was not good, right? And the, the PC market, which they are still highly dependent on, is not good. And we got a really bearish pattern here. So I'm looking, you know, we're short this. It's a great one to play with, uh, with puts. You know, I like to go out about, oh, I think we're out in the October or November. I have to go look at my spec sheet here on these. we got to stop here at uh, at uh, 33.39. Got a target level down here, 27 to 24 for a nice wave 5 move, and, and it's and it's happening. So there's a nice trade go, uh, short on Intel. <coughs> short it directly, or it's a nice uh, put option play as well. And... You know, pretty pretty tight stop. So if it turns around, heads back up, we'll just get out with a small loss and move on to the next one. But like it so far. All right. Back to you. Uh, looks like uh, I guess Matt's having problems again. Uh, Gary, if you want to go ahead and answer. no problem, let me uh, let me share my screen here. Uh, the, oh, where are we? I'm just gonna go here. Share. Um, okay, so my the, what I like uh, right now is I, like I said, I'm leaning towards the uh, the short side. I actually took this trade on Friday uh, based on our uh, April 22nd turn date, but. It's IWM. Uh, I'm trading the uh, the 113, the May May 113 puts. Um, I I bought them on Friday. I'm doing pretty well with it right now. But the pattern that's in play, it's 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 actually it's a bear flag right here with this channel. And uh, short term, I I'm expecting them to close the gap uh, down at the 110. But I really do believe that. We're going to see IWM trading bare minimum down to the 106, possibly even down to the 104 or lower. And uh, it's been the lagger, this entire move, because you have the S&P and the Dow that are well above the 78% retracement levels from uh, from the high to the low. And you can see that IWM hasn't even made it to the 62% retracement. So we have the bearish divergences on the daily chart. We're pretty overbought. We have, you know, we know sentiment is at uh, bullish extremes on the overall markets. And I'm taking this with a, you know, I, I, I think a conservative short-term target is going to be anywhere between the the 106.40 uh, down to the 104, so I have the 113 puts. If it uh, if it works out, then it will be a really nice trade. And basically, my stop is is if it takes out the uh, the highs up at the uh, that we made on Friday. So that's when I took the trade. So I don't really have a lot of exposure right now. I may lose a, a few hundred bucks if it takes these out just on the time base of it, but 
the risk reward is losing a few hundred bucks, but possibly uh, doing really, really well with the uh, with the actual trade. So uh, that's my call. The one thirteen, the May uh, one thirteen puts on the small caps IWM. Sounds good, uh, Mike. Um, <clears throat> on a short term basis, I really like uh, both Dean and Gary's trades. Um, but being that I'm a premium seller, when I go over to options, I would be looking to see where the the fat calls are, and I'd be looking to sell those. Same result. So I really like that analysis, and I really like the trade. But I'm looking to sell premium in IWM. Um, in Intel, love the company, but I have to agree with what Dean's saying. I'd be looking for something there. Primarily, though, I on a short-term basis, I'm a day trader. Um, on a longer-term basis, I continue to accumulate gold and silver, and um, those are based on the analysis and the views that uh, both Dean and Gary um, have uh, told us already on that long-term view, like the world's going to come to an end. And so I think that it's, it's just prudent to continue to uh, you know, put away gold, put away silver, and I'm starting to see silver decouple from gold, so it's beginning to have its own energy again, which is really kind of exciting to see. Um, and then as far as a core short-term position, bonds, and I just roll it, roll it, and continue to roll it. Sounds good, uh, Mike and James. <clears throat> so uh, right now, I'd be looking to get short any stock <clears throat> of a company whose main business is taking metals out of the ground. Um, we saw a just absurd amount of bearish, unusual options activity <clears throat> on Thursday and Friday of last week in all of these mining names. The biggest one was definitely FCX. Uh, by the time the bell rang on Friday, traders had bought about 60000 of the June 11 strike puts from anywhere between about a dollar and ten cents to a dollar and fifteen cents, we saw <clears throat> not in quite as large of size, but humongous blocks of puts being bought in Rio Tinto, BHP, and blocks of puts being bought in XME, which is the ETF that covers that sector. All of those trades, um, in my opinion, are you know speculative bearish bets. There's always a chance that. When you see blocks of puts being bought like that, traders are coming in and buying them as a hedge against long stock. Uh, FCX actually has earnings tomorrow. I'm long some of these puts. I think today, before the close, I'll probably roll out of these and into some of the ones that they bought, either in the XME or one of the other individual names. Um, before the earnings, there's a lot of gap risk uh, holding options through earnings. And being long puts <clears throat> after the earnings event, uh, I get... Uh, exposed to quite a bit of uh, implied volatility if it, if it were to kind of collapse on me. But I'd be looking to get short any of those names, any blocks of puts that I see you know, the rest of this week I'll be looking at as possible long, uh, as possible uh, candidates for, for a trade. And I think if you have a holding period anywhere between you know, four to eight weeks from now, that's a good place to, uh, to be short. If you take a look at the chart of FCX here, not a very bullish looking um, uh, set of candles there over the last couple of days. So that's my uh, top play for right now. Sounds good. Uh, like that, let me go ahead and tell you mine. Uh, put this one on last week. Let me show you my options house platform here. Uh, a bullish double vertical on uh, VXX out to June. Why out to June and why VXX? Well, and it's interesting, you know, the Dow was down almost triple digits uh, a little while ago. And that's what your portfolio, in my opinion, should look like. And on a day when the market's kind of really getting hit hard, you should have a blinding green in your uh, in your portfolio, and that should be a hedge. So this is a, a bullish double vertical, and some folks who are new to options, this will blow your mind away, but this is a great trade, because when you think about it, it, I tell my traders, when vol is cheap, you buy it, when it's expensive, you sell it, and with the VXX uh, down here in the teens, and, and the VIX down, I mean, geez, we had a 12 print. Uh, what was it last week? That's just that's that's nuts. Now I'm sitting here in Fort Lauderdale, like I said, looking out ocean, beautiful day. This is the time to buy hurricane insurance in South Florida. 
it ain't when Channel 5 News comes on and says, hey, there's a tropical depression over the uh, Bahamas and it's heading towards Florida. It's a little late. So I don't know if something's going to happen between now and, I mean, hell, in the next 10 minutes or the next month or two months. But I'd like to have a little ejection seat in case what all you guys said, uh, Gary, Dean, and, and James, if we do kind of have the uh, Fred Sanford, kind of the big one, and we do end up flying into the, into the ground. So this is called a bullish double vertical where I have a bull call spread on and a bull put spread on. It's called a double vertical because it's that's exactly what it is. It's two vertical spreads with the same strategic mindset. So I'm bullish on vol, so I got a bull put and a bull call. And the bull put spread is a credit spread, obviously, and that finances the bull call spread. I'm cheap. I, I, don't, I don't like coming out of pocket for anything. So if I think VXX is going up, yeah, I could do a bull call spread. But if you think something is going up, you also don't think it's going to do what? Go down. So if you don't think something's going down, why don't you put on the bull put spread? So that's my trade that I like, the 14, 15, 16, 17. Um, and it could potentially, if, if the market rolls over, like you guys say, and vol spikes, this trade could potentially make, you know, 8,700 bucks. Um, well, that's a pretty low probability, Wiz, 39%. Well, look at the break even. There's a 60% uh, probability of breaking even. So this is a nice, and I got paid to do this trade. It, it was a credit. I got paid to put a little insurance on, on my portfolio. So while all my longs here might get hit a little bit, these are out to Jan 17 and, and Jan 18, longer term trades, Russia, uh, China, JP Morgan, Facebook, all sorts of guys. Why don't, why don't I hedge the front month and have a little ejection seat on? So that's, that's, what, uh, that's what I'm looking at. So um, all right, guys, I'll tell you what. Uh, let's go ahead and give a quick wrap up, uh, uh, top to bottom, starting with Dean. Uh, where we can find out what you do, Dean, and get a hold of you. Okay, so I hope I'm sharing the right screen. My home, my home page here is followmetrades.com, and uh, yeah, you, uh, I'm seeing your uh, your chart there. So yeah, how about that, huh? So anyway. Uh, followmetrades.com is the website. That's where you can find out more. You can sign up. Um, again, I'm running a, a free live trading room around the Fed meeting announcement because I think there'll be volatility even if they say nothing. So that's going to be fun. And uh, that's really it. Make sure you use risk control. Everybody talked about it. You know, if you're listening, that's the key, right? Have have your risk identified and stick to those rules, right? Win big, lose little. Like it. Yeah, absolutely right. Great advice, Dean. Gary. Okay. Well, um, well, what we're doing, uh, we, we're actually having a, a a special that we're running right now for people that are listening here, and uh, we're at sentimenttiming.com. Uh, we're doing it for just I have put the special down for this, and it's a uh, zero four two five six one special, and uh, you can get it. Uh, you know, just go over to sentimenttiming.com. We have, uh, like I said, we have some really good. Uh, Turn dates that are uh, approaching, uh, actually approached on Friday, and we're expecting uh, a pretty big move, and we actually already have when the low should be taking place, and uh, we're really going to just move our, our uh, portfolio through that. So sentimenttiming.com, and thank you for uh, letting me share this here. You bet, Gary. Thanks uh, Thanks for coming, man. Mike? Um, again, uh, my webpage is uh, logicalsignals.com. And as I mentioned on the intro, I am getting ready to launch uh, two auto traders, which are algorithmically based. And um, so those will be available only through the trade room. And I tend to really limit the number. And I limit the number of uh, people that come into the trade room. Um, so I kind of do a what I call vetting. Basically, I, I have each trader who has an interest. They talk with me, and we kind of go over a couple of things. But uh, I am going to be looking to uh, add to uh, the trade room currently, and we're also expanding and opening up additional trade rooms, which will focus on particular products. One will focus on bonds. One will focus on equities. One will focus on, say, for example, crude, gold, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so anybody that has an interest, uh, LogicalSignals.com. You can uh, read about it within the trade room tab, and also you can contact me through the the website. Awesome, Mike. Appreciate it. And James. 
So you should see the uh, homepage of our website here, alphashark.com. One really easy and simple way to kind of uh, follow along with what it is that we've got going on is to sign up for our weekly webinar series right here on <clears throat> the homepage of the website. We give uh, four to six webinars a week on different topics, uh, options, stock, futures, and uh, other things like that. And another great way to get in touch with us is to shoot me an email James at alphashark.com. I do my best to respond within 24 hours. If you have any questions about unusual options activity, how you can maybe apply that to your trading plan, even if you're not someone who is a uh, you know hardcore options trader, you don't have to be an options expert to get <clears throat> valuable information from options order flow. Um, if anything, I think options order flow gives you uh, the clearest view into the world of institutional trading and where they're putting their risk capital. It's very difficult to follow. Uh, money flow and equities markets as most volume takes place in dark pools. And that isn't the case with options. So even if you don't yep. consider yourself an options person, come check it out. I guarantee you that regardless of what you trade, there's valuable information to be had by watching order flow and options. Correct. Even if yeah, if you're creeped out about options, it's still good intel gathering because it, it's going to impact either a stock or an option the same way. Uh, so awesome. Uh, and then finally for me, folks, I'm actually doing a, uh, a session after the close uh, today here at uh, Top Gun Options. I think you guys can see my screen. Can you guys – hold on one second. Uh, and you can head to – whoops, oh, never mind. Uh, it's go.topgunoptions.com slash FT30, I believe it is. Let me uh, – my computer's really slow here. Yep. Uh, just write this URL down, go.topgunoptions.com slash FT, that's Foxtrot Tango 30. That's for our full throttle program. We're going to be talking about uh, uh, some some pretty cool stuff after we did our uh, full throttle program last week. So there it is right there, go.topgunoptions.com slash FT 30. Awesome. All right. Hey, uh, David, I'll throw it back to you. Thanks for having me uh, and uh, a great uh, team of uh, guys here, Dean, Gary, Mike, and James. Pleasure working with you. I hope to be working with you again soon, and I'll throw it back to you, David. All right. Uh, thanks, guys. Great discussion. So I uh, just want to remind everyone watching, you can go to timingresearch.com, and you can download this or any past reports there. You can also... Um, watch the recording of this show in in a few minutes uh, after we're done here, or uh, watch any past show as well. Um, also, be sure to go to timingresearch.com slash current survey um, this coming weekend to, to fill out the next survey and, and have your ideas be part of the next report. So uh, I just want to thank my guests again, Dean Jenkins of followmetrades.com, Gary Dean of sentimenttrading.com, Michael Filiera of LogicalSignals.com, James Torelli of AlphaShark.com, and, of course, Matt Buckley of TopGunOptions.com. Thank you for hosting again. Thank you. Thanks, guys. We'll see you later. Thanks.